I'm Josh Cooperman, and this is Convo by Design. Today, you are going to hear from Daniel Marcus, CEO, and Jonathan Michel, Head of Design of Swadaloon. Like everything in life, this podcast has changed over the years. I've changed over the years. The business of design and those who contribute has changed over the years. I'm sure you've changed over the years, which is why I love to begin each episode with an origin story of the guests who join me for these conversations. You'll hear why. What's really fun about the following chat is that of all the things that have changed over time, the loom and texturing, uh, textile manufacturing kind of hasn't really changed all that much. The yarns have, um, some of the machine techniques have, but the loom has not. Textiles are magical to me. The materiality of a fine silk, the texture, colors, and ability to create is one of the concepts that allows designers to create exceptional spaces that differentiate based on color, shape, and pattern, for sure, but also the experiential nature of a space that allows clients to add those additional senses of touch, how, how a textile feels, and the smell of it. You know, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you have material in a, in a well-designed home made out of the finest silks from Asia, you can smell that in the material. It's amazing. This conversation covers all of the above and more. One of the concepts explored is how this company is addressing the challenges of achieving balance between modern design requirements and the artisan nature of weaving. Love this, and I think you will too. We'll get to all that right after this. I am just incredibly proud of this partnership I've got with Thermosol. They have been presenting partners of Convo by Design going on five years now, and there is a certain amount of pride that comes with saying that the show is presented by the company that is the best in the world at what they do. Thermosol engineers the most exceptional smart shower products and steam shower systems worldwide, full stop. And it's for a few reasons. First of all, they were the first company to design and patent the technology here in the United States, dating back to 1958. Thermosol, a US-based manufacturer, based in Round Rock, Texas, employs an engineering team that designs, tests, and continuously refines the product. Their quality control team tests every single steam generator before it departs the factory. Who else does that? Nobody that I know of. I have the pleasure of working with some world-class designers and architects who tell me, and if you're in the business, you know this, that the idea of luxury has changed especially when clients want a spa-like bathroom. Steam is mandatory, or it's just not considered a, a luxury. And if you want to add steam, you have only one true option, my opinion, and that's Thermosol. Mitch Altman, third-generation CEO of this family-owned company of 65 years, continues to innovate in the bathroom and shower space through technological marvels such as intelligent showering systems, sound therapy, aromatherapy, technical interfaces, and so much more. And now Thermosol, the industry leader in steam bath equipment and technology since 1958, as I mentioned, is enhancing its already stellar family of products with the new indoor and outdoor luxury saunas available in three designs. The configurations are absolutely amazing, and you should probably go check them out. Indoor and outdoor options, it's amazing. You really do need to check them out. Uh, go to thermosol.com or at Thermosol on the socials. One of the things that I absolutely love, and if, you know, for those listening to the show, you know this, is that I love the, the backstory. I love the origin story. I love, I, I just, I find it fascinating how like-minded individuals or sometimes unlike-minded individuals find themselves working together uh, to, to create something that creates some things. So what is the origin story? How did, how, did, how did you two find each other? How did the firm begin um, and why? 
Shall we begin with how we began begin um, with the beginning. To, to kick off the beginning? Um, the beginning actually is a series of serendipitous events that happened to me. Um, and at the time, I was in two minds whether I believed in destiny. But now I know that destiny is not about the future. Um, it's about the present and what is. I kind of believe in it. But what happened was I, I went to Southeast Asia with my partner at the time, uh, who was French Lao, who is French Lao. Um, and it was the first time I'd visited uh, Asia at all, uh, let alone Southeast Asia. And we went to Laos because that was the country of his birth. Um, and a couple of events happened that uh, really kind of freaked me out and pushed me <laughs> towards doing what we were doing. A little bit of background about myself. Um, I was actually working in telecoms at the time. My my ex-boss was the founder of Android, the guy who invented Android, except it was his previous company. And I was happily working in telecoms, but my grandma was a draper and we were always surrounded by fabrics. So I always loved fabrics. And when I went to uh, Luang Prabang, which is the old royal capital of, of Laos, which is a very popular uh, tourist destination and world heritage site, um, in the beautiful hotel of the Princess Manalai, um, there was this lady sitting with the general manager who had just welcomed us. And she was showing him these beautiful silks. And I was looking at this and I was just gobsmacked. I'm like, I've never seen anything like this. This is gorgeous. So after she'd finished her meeting, she said, um, I said to her, who, who are you? And she said, I'm an interior designer. And um, that was one half of the coin. And the other half was during our trip to Laos, through a series of events, we got invited to some village outside the capital city of Vientiane. And there were some people uh, sitting around um, discussing what we were discussing about the fabrics. And somebody popped up and said, oh, there's this guy in the next village along who's a weaver, this really old guy. And it sounds like you're matching the story because you're saying that uh, that my partner, basically his grandma used to weave with the Queen of Laos when in the old days before uh, the uh, takeover by the current government in 1975 when the Vietnamese War broke up, uh, what we call Indochina, and everything kind of changed. Um, he said that that's the story of, of some other weaver, you know, in the next village along weaving with the Queen of Laos. And we were like, what? The sun's very weird. So we went in search of this weaver. And this weaver turns out to be one of my ex-partner's grandma's weaving uh, team from 1950. Just by chance. I mean, literally just by chance. And those two events together, I said, uh, we were, when we started looking into this more, we found that uh, weaving tradition was going, was being lost. Uh, this kind of weaving that we saw was not going to be continued anymore because there was nobody to buy it. And I said, oh God, that's ridiculous. I mean, there must be people to buy it. And that's how the company was founded. Jonathan, I think that told the whole story. <laughs> that's not how we met. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Just a, so quick, a quick, quick, add, quick add on to segue into to, to Jonathan. Um, we we did an exhibition in Paris. We were living in Paris at the time. We did an exhibition in Paris. We did it in the Palais Royal in 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 the Ibu Polans Gallery. If people know who she is, she's uh, uh, not not alive anymore, but she has a gallery still there. We did an exhibition there, and the only people who walked in and went, "Wow, I want to buy this," were interior designers, and they wanted to make curtains out of the silks that we had woven. Um, now I'll segue into Jonathan because that mm -hmm. kind of introduces where where we kind of met. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my background is actually as a weaver, and I found myself in working in interior design. And while I was uh, sitting as the um, textile specialist for Peter Marino, um, I found Swadaloon, and or Swadaloon sort of found me, I guess, because it was there waiting for me. Um, and in fact, serendipitously, I was in Asia on a work trip. I think it was 2013. And I actually was in Laos to see somebody else. And a friend of mine said, oh, you're in VN10. You have to go see Swadaloon. OK, so I went over there. Um, this ex-partner of, um, of Daniel's put me on his motorcycle. He we went over to the mill. I saw this incredible operation. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was smaller back then. But, you know, it was just like so eye-opening that like 
you know, I know weaving, but this is like hand jacquard weaving. Like nobody does this anymore. So it was really inspiring to be there. And of course, you know, it was a, a favorite fabric to use on projects. So I kind of like to say that I've been designing for Swadaloon for <laughs> over 10 years because I started at PMA in 2011 and started working with Swadaloon then. I think maybe I only met Daniel maybe once in passing at my time there. And then wow. on a on a trip, a uh, fateful <laughs> trip, 2019, just before the pandemic, we met up with some mutual friends in Santa Fe. Uh, Daniel had the new collection and said to me, what do you think? And I said, I'm, I'm very honest in my <laughs> in my approach to, to, to everything, but especially my work in textiles. And I just said, it could be better. And I said, well, what do you mean? You know, of course, this was his kind of baby in the moment. So um, maybe he, you, you can tell that your side of the story, Daniel. But um, Ooh, I said, well, funny. I think, you know, the sampling could go like this. And I think the colors could be different. I think you should finish them before doing the set for Loom State. And the conversation started. And now it's, what, five years later, and I'm the design director, and it's sort of come full circle. So that's our story. So tell me about taking product to market in a post-pandemic industrial environment. And I, and I ask the question because, I, you know, I am, I am fascinated with handmade products in a, in a purely industrial environment society as as we are now there is a return to to value you know for so long hand handmade objects were sort of seen as crafty you mm -hmm. know and somehow less than you know major market produced items and objects and now we've gotten to this point where the, there is a special nature returned to handmade objects and and to things that are that are special and unique with with the with all of the wabi sabi philosophy attached. Like if there's a if there's a mistake, if there's a nod, it's it's not seen as a mistake. It's seen as a as as a specialty. Like it's it's like a gift. It's like a pearl. Can we, <laughs> can we quote you on that to all our, all our hey absolutely <laughs> listen and, and by the way because. And, and I say this because that's what I that's what I hear from designers because that's what I hear they hear from their clients. They want to clients want to be able to tell a story. They want to be able to tell the story of where their materials came from. Absolutely. And but at the same time, it is harder to travel now. It is supply chain is still an issue and forever will be. And when you have international issues that you have to address as well. These are major issues that I'm I'm sure you've had to address and continually have to address. And I'm and I'm curious how you navigate that and how you navigated it through the pandemic and how you navigate it post-pandemic. It's a really interesting question. I think that during the pandemic, um we were getting going. So we had a little bit of time because we were, we thought, oh, this is great. We can use this time because we had a collection before and we had Johnny's Jonathan's collection afterwards, we, we, we kind of amalgamated the two collections. There was quite a lot of work to do because everything is hand woven. So that means, you know, the design might take a day or two to decide what we're going to do, but then it actually takes quite a long time to get it done. Um, we used our time wisely. Then there was an upturn in the market uh, after the pandemic, which we rode the wave of with our new collection. So from that point of view, we felt really edified that we'd, we'd spent a little bit of time not panicking. What is most interesting for me is uh, product to market um, is one thing, and, and we have to um, we have to take that extremely seriously. Uh, because obviously you're delivering a, a product to a customer. But at the other end, one end of, of the supply chain is a community of weavers, of artisans. And our motivation and our goal within our company is to preserve that community. That community provides, often it's women. We have quite a few men now because we have dyers, we have training dyers, et cetera, et cetera. But in Laos, which is, if people don't know, it's it's a very poor country the size of the United Kingdom, um, but with a population of about 7 million. So taking on with an incredible silk weaving tradition. So with taking this on board and protecting its heritage with my current business partner, who is uh, 
um, runs the workshop and she's Lao and her, her husband's actually a congressman. So it's extremely important to get things right for the nation because that's their heritage. That's their cultural heritage. They don't have anything else. Artistic heritage, they don't paint. They don't do other things other people do. They weave. And they weave, you could see a loom in somebody's front yard and the grandma or even the mother or even the daughter weaving. Even today, you can do that. And that's extremely important that we keep that tradition going. So what we did was there was this, uh, people were laid off left, right and center uh, in Laos. Whereas I don't know what happened in the States, but we got some salary in the UK paid by the government, some loans, et cetera, et cetera. There was nothing in Laos. We kept all our workforce on. We paid everybody throughout the pandemic. And when the pandemic finished, um, we we had this incredible collection to, to give to our customers and they received it with open arms. I think that it was uh, just a, a very, very good stop think moment for us. I don't know how you, Jonathan, would would uh, add to that since you're also, you know, selling in New York. So maybe you can add a bit. Uh, yeah, um, um, the question of uh, supply chain, I think for us happens. Uh, Daniel, before my time, did this quite amazing thing where in Laos, they only were weaving with silk. This um, These weavers were only weaving with silk, super fine, very delicate, incredible product. But it doesn't always translate to an interior design market because it's not kind of in fashion. People can't use it. You know, Maybe they're using it for a cushion. Maybe they're using it in one very special room. But in order to expand our offering, Daniel got yarns from mostly from um, Italy, yes. right? Mm-hmm. Italy. Mm-hmm. Um, incredible boucles, wools, cottons, linens, hemp that uh, weren't available um, in Asia or in Laos. And so um, shoot, sorry. we started up a new trade route from Milan to Vientiane uh, with an air trade route to get the yarns across. But we had to get it at a special price. We had to. It was quite complicated, but it was worth it because the result is Lao weaving, this traditional weaving, together with these incredible yarns. Um, so we're making a, a, thir- a, a third kind of product, but very contemporary. So I, one of the things that Jonathan and I discussed is weaving tradition, it's very, very important to maintain it. But let's not be stuck in the past. If we, If they're weaving something beautiful, which is using traditional looms, but it doesn't look like anything they've ever wove before. The purists always say, but that's not Lao weaving. And I say, yes, it is. Because in order to maintain a community today, you have to maintain it in the sense of what the what the customer expects today. It has to be based on business. You are listening to my conversation with Daniel and Jonathan from Swadaloon. We'll be right back. Man, I, I love this. I, I have a new sponsor partner, on the show that I want to introduce you to if you're not already familiar with them. If you are a specifying designer, architect, landscape architect, or savvy design enthusiast, if you have heard about the quiet luxury movement, this idea of crafting a lifestyle around understated elegance, simplicity, and sophistication, there's more to it than that. And I will add uncomplicated living. Isn't that what we all strive for? I'm, I am extremely happy. I'm really thrilled to share a company that embodies all of this, utilizing proprietary technology and a focus on sustainability in their stunningly beautiful products. It's TimberTech. TimberTech is the premium decking company delivering multi-tonal color blending and natural wood textures in a product that is virtually indistinguishable from a natural wood product. What does this mean? It means it's everything wood should be, a beautiful look that blends seamlessly with a well-designed space, providing years of enjoyment and performs the way you want it to. No splintering, fading, peeling, cracking, or rotting. I I had a wood deck uh, at our Manhattan Beach home and I got to tell you, it was exasperating every year doing the random board flip, taking out nails, resetting them, restaining them. It was a complete pain. It was complicated and I didn't look forward to it. 
I wish I had TimberTech because TimberTech is not only uncomplicated, it's beautiful. It comes in over 20 finish options and nine collections, and 85% of the material is recycled. This is premium decking for your next project. Learn more and specify it for your next design project, TimberTech, on the socials, or TimberTech.com, where you can find a retailer near you, as well as a number of tools to create, design, order samples, and get the expert help you may need. TimberTech is uncomplicated luxury and performs. It's your choice for your next deck project. As a busy professional designer, you know how important it is to find the right partnerships. Partnerships that allow you to specify the right products for every project. Professionals like you don't just have time to sit around and waste, right? So let me tell you about one of my partnerships. Pacific Sales is here to serve you with expert, knowledgeable, and non-commissioned professionals to help you specify the right product for all your projects non-commissioned. That means their only incentive is your satisfaction. Pacific Sales Kitchen and Home, a Best Buy company, has just that, with over 60 years of service in Southern California. Pacific Sales is your destination for exploration, advice, and inspiration. And you will find all your favorite brands, like Monogram, and their commitment to providing exceptional products, starting with materials. Monogram sources commercial-grade stainless steel on their refrigerators, unscratchable sapphire glass on their cooktop knobs, durable marine-grade bearings on their dishwasher racks. Monogram takes inspiration from the leading-edge materials used in the high-end automotive and aeronautics industry to provide you with lasting beauty and exceptional quality. The beauty is backed by the same level of attention to performance, which is why Monogram appliances are trusted and sought after by chefs all over the country. Chain-driven French oven doors that can be opened with one hand, and an industry-exclusive hearth oven that allows for all-electric indoor brick oven-style cooking without the need for external ventilation. These are just a few of the things that make Monogram so special. Pacific Sales features Monogram Appliances, and Pacific Sales Kitchen and Home Team is here to help you and offer their Pro Rewards Program, which is a trade program unlike any you have experienced before. And here's the cherry on top, access. Access to exclusive builder trade incentives from top brands like Monogram. Visit a Pacific Sales showroom today to learn how you can unlock additional savings and benefits. Don't miss out on the opportunity to work with the best of the best. Visit Pacific Sales Kitchen and Home today and elevate your projects to new heights. Pacific Sales Kitchen and Home, where excellence meets expertise. And for, forgive my naivete, I'm, I'm just curious, is there a, because traditional Lao weaving, I, I assume, has traditional patterns, textures, tapestries, um, is, is that going... Do you run up against the purists still who say, well, that's not Lao weaving um, because there's a difference in the in the cultural presentation of, of what the artistry is? Or are they just using these new materials, but still using the same designs? And to add on to that, curious um, where new designs come from, or do you focus primarily on the traditional cultural design? I can speak to that as a, as a designer. I mean, I love to say that my job is made infinitely easier because I have a millennial's worth of designs to choose from, right? I have this heritage archive. And so um, I get to say, oh, this design, but let's make it bigger. This design, but let's, you know, combine it with this other design or let's use these yarns. So the starting point is almost always that traditional um, heritage design that we're starting with, whether we're reinventing it or using new yarns or combining it in a, in a new way with another pattern that maybe hadn't been done before. But then on the top of that, in order to support those sort of special designs, we've introduced boucles, solids, uh, stripes, textures, that, you know, the, the color I think speaks to the vibrancy of Lao. The, there's still the hand woven quality, even though it's not an intricate pattern, it might just be a, uh, a solid but you can still see the hand. It's still the, 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 the spirit of the cloth is still in the fabric because of its irregularities and all the things you, you spoke um, about uh, hand weaving. So it's a combination of honoring the designs as the heritage designs as they were and modernizing them uh, you know, in, a, in a way that works for 
our market because otherwise there wouldn't be a business. It would be a, you know, it would be a tourist shop on the corner that, you know, these very expensive silks that don't even know what to do with would just be there. And it wouldn't, you know, eventually that wouldn't support many people and it would just go away. So we're trying to find a way to revive and keep alive these traditions. And that, that means we have to modernize and we have to incorporate some ideas from our market and work the other way, work back and forth between their traditions and the market that we're dealing with, the reality of it. Market expectations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where's the pushback on that? You know, that's kind of funny because I'm going to say something very shocking here. I don't, <laughs> I, th I don't think hand weaving is adapt is 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 readily adaptable to uh, modern interior design or modern interior designers' requirements because they want now lots reproducible, scalable, blah de blah de blah, and and artisan weaving <clears throat> isn't scalable, isn't reproducible. Um, and the way we've got there is because um, all of us together, uh, the triumvirate, um, Jonathan, me and, and Pai, who runs the workshop, have all decided that this is what we want to do. And therefore, we're going to we're going to find a, a happy medium between the two. And what you said is is somewhat correct that that um, we are forgiven by our customers and our customers customers. And you, I completely agree with you that more and more that's happening because the younger generation that's taking over from the buying to, for, as buyers or customers or clients of interior designers are more wary of what they're buying. They want to know where does it come from? What does it use? And we can literally tell a story of every single component in the weaving right back to the yarn manufacturer and their families and how it supports this old mill in Italy, um, the only surviving silk mill in 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 one of the silk yarn spinners in Italy, um, et cetera, et cetera, right down the line. So that there is a very, very good reason to do it, but it's an extremely hard thing to do. I always say, our challenge is not in the total, it's in the makeup of. There are thousands of moving parts. Each one has to be done absolutely perfectly. And when it's put onto a machine, it's much easier. So I get it. It's cheaper, it's easier. And at the end of the day, you know, when 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 everything's uh, on the table in front of everybody, and if the fabric, we turn around and say, well, that fabric is going to cost you $500 a, a yard, we won't sell any. So we've got to make the price reasonable as well. So there's a lot of components. Is it worth it? I mean, personally, I have fun every day. I watch our community. We've got about 40 people in the company. I watch our community of weavers and dyers who we've trained because we, there was no dyeing in Laos, for example. So we had to get dyeing in from, from Thailand. We had to be taught from scratch. Um, and now we're teaching other people. It's creating artisan work. And it is a pleasure to see these people so happy buying, uh, building their houses, buying a motorbike, buying a car, uh, doing normal things that we take for granted, bringing their kids in after school, being able to play in the courtyard and be safe playing with each other. And this is what life is about. Making money is a consequence of good living. We have to be very careful about making money because that's, you know, our, our, our ground root chakra, if you want to, to go philosophical. And that's what, you know, we, we need to do to put the food on the table. But once that's done, um, it's about life. And this product is about life. And our, our community uh, of, of interior designers, right the way back through us to our artisans, it's all about community. And I think the secret to success and I think the secret to solving the planet's problems lie in community. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that's absolutely true. Here's what's, here's what's so interesting to me. Um, you know, in talking about the, the business of design, you have to talk about the design business because the two are inextricably tied now and you know i i've heard numbers banded about of you know like one percent of the population utilizes the services of a designer or an architect and i think that's probably true but i i think it's also fascinating that 
100% of the, of the people that are listening to this and 99.999% of the population is, lives in a house or dwelling of, of some sort. Decoration and design of one's dwelling goes back to like Neanderthals, right? And cave drawings. And it's always been a part of society. I don't know what I don't know what that is. I don't know where that comes from, this need to decorate one's dwelling, this nesting, if you will. But it's, it's, it's a ubiquitous concept. But now there seems to be a difference where, and when you talk about an artisan product, I'm just curious, how do you keep from the product becoming commoditized? And you know, when you talk about the business, how do you have those conversations where maybe it's not $500 a yard, but maybe it is more expensive because it has to be more expensive because it is handmade. Machines don't need to be paid by the hour, but people do. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you have the value proposition conversation and how do, you, how do you succeed in that regard? Um, it's a tough one. I think that uh, when I started out, when we started out, um, I mean, it's it's kind of 20 years ago now, we weren't doing interior design, we weren't doing fabrics for interior design. We did little shows around Europe mostly. And what I found was people would come and go, oh my God, that's beautiful. So the soul was speaking and then they'd say, how much is it? And I'd say what it was, you know, it might be a throw or it might've been a shawl or something like that, that we'd woven in traditional designs in two ply silk, which is extremely difficult to do and takes about three or four weeks to just do literally one, one big throw. Um, and I'd say that the price would be a thousand dollars or whatever it is, they just fall over. Even if they had the money, they'd fall over because their, their heart was saying, we love it. And their head was saying, that's ridiculous. Nothing costs a thousand dollars. So then, you know, I was still working in telecoms when I started off. I did the two jobs at, at the same time and, and was saved by the uh, uh, prime mortgage crash, which brought all the banks down and the company I was working for closed. And I said, OK, I'm going to go full, full time in 2009. But until then, I was working in both companies. And so I had the both kind of inputs. And when we are faced with new technology, I, I kind of took my these thousand year old fabrics kind of idea, uh, but but did, did the, the, the new technology idea. You know, how do we get new technology across people's and, and the, we, we use words such as evangelism in, in we used to use as in technology trade because we have to actually give people an excitable reason to do something to use i mean in the old days i was saying my old boss was you know mr android he he we were working on you know these kind of mobile phones which which we now use people didn't want to use them in the beginning so uh, looking at uh, silk you think oh well it's kind of a little bit more easy and i i i stumbled across this fact that our interior designers are amazing ambassadors and they are the ones who, who, if you explain to them the story behind it, they will help promote it to their customers and explain and bridge that gap that I, I, I exposed a few minutes ago, that when the person sees it, they love it, but when they hear the price, they faint. And I think that when we, when we <laughs> do produce a new product, we go through this rigorous kind of you know, non-design process of what I call top-down, bottom-up. Bottom-up is how much is it costing us? What do we have to do? La, 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 la. And it goes gets to this price. And top-down is our customer is buying it. What are they going to be looking at? And they're, you know, Jonathan's very useful because <laughs> he's kind of been on both sides of the, the coin and is able to turn around and go, oh, I don't think we're going to be able to sell it at that price. And that means that maybe we'll have to swap out a yarn as we're developing to get something a little bit cheaper. Be practical, but keep it relevant, number one, and keep it special, number two. And if we can do that, we have a winner on our hands. And I think our new collection really reflects that. Do you, do you not think, Jonathan? Oh, yeah. No, I just wanted to say that more often than the way you pre presented it, I'm saying, no, 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 they will pay for this because it is special. And, you know, I always say to Daniel, uh, we want people to fall in love with this and then need it. And then the price is incidental, right? Because, I mean, you're either in this market where you can afford and your clients have the budgets or not. So, we're, you know, but by the default, we're, we're 
we're in a very lucky place, a very lucky market to be in. And this emotional attachment, this like, I mean, we talk about it like, oh, we want them to kind of really fall in love with this fabric. And then my goal as a designer is always to create things that aren't replaceable, right? They can't just say like, oh, well, it's too expensive. Let's just go to the D&D and find another one similar that fills that space. They can't, yeah, yeah. right? That's my goal. You, they can't do it because it's not at the D&D, right? It's very special. So maybe they'll say, we really love this. We want to use it. Okay, let's use it. You know, the, our client this time doesn't have the budget. Let's use it on some cushions in the, you know, the most formal sitting room, right? Or next time they might have a budget where they can do curtains and they can do them in the, you know, primary bedroom. And so, you know, it becomes, uh, you know, depending on the budget is what they can use it for. And and this ambassador word that Daniel used is, it, I, I listened recently to your um, interview with Matthew Storms and he talked about uh, the Medicis and patrons of the arts. And that's kind of exactly the same thing that we're doing here where we are the, we're the design company with our, there's a few different steps, right? There's the weavers in Laos. There's Daniel and I in the West, quote unquote, the West, uh, presenting this uh, uh, collection to, you know, the the designers who are the ambassadors who are then going to go to the Medici's, right? The Medici's <laughs> have all the money and they've hired the designer and the designers are hiring us and we're going to the Laos people to weave it, right? So we're connecting the two communities, not only the community that's in Laos weaving, but the community, the Medici's, if you will, <laughs> at the other end who have the money to spend to support those people. I mean, it's this amazing um, connection between the two. And, and, and we're, we're, you know, we're in the middle, we're doing the business of, of making that happen, of connecting that. And, you know, it's interesting for me too, because having so many conversations with designers. Designers are really interesting. I, I love speaking with designers. I love working with designers. I love working with architects. But as in every professional trade, uh, as in every artisan, you have exceptional ones, you have great ones, you have mid-level ones, and then you have the people who think that that's what they want to do, and then they kind of go do that, and then they go do something else. Um, and with that comes the education process. And it's really interesting because wouldn't it be great if, you know, Daniel, if, if every time a, a designer got a project where they wanted to specify your product, you actually got to go in and talk to their client and say, well, here's what you can do with it. And here's your design. And here's how we, you can use this for the furniture and you can use this for the drapery and you can use this for, and, and you can, but oftentimes many especially in the age of social media, you'll get a, a Pinterest, turns into a Pinterest board, turns into a mood board, turns into a inspiration board. And then somehow everything is just like, well, let's just call them and get samples and move on and call it a day. I, I, we seem to be at this crossroads where special products are being incorporated into projects not not wholesale or or the entire project, but into certain areas, and that's because it it has become more challenging for designers to stay up to date on what new products are available, and especially post pandemic, because you know two years of being locked down, everybody went into R and D and created this whole new series. Everyone created new products from from textiles to appliances, everybody created new stuff. And then at post pandemic, all of this new stuff rolled out. We're still seeing the new things being rolled out. You know, um, how do you, how do you navigate that part of it? Are you, and I guess the question is, do you see the company, the firm being a small boutique company and that's where you want it to be. Do you have ambitions to do more licensing deals to take, you know, which is not a, it's not a dirty word. It's not a bad thing to say, Hey, we want to take the, the designs that we're creating and to have a handmade line, but also maybe license something to bigger manufacturers. Is, is that on the radar or are you happy 
in, in this boutique world in which you find yourself? I'm, I, <clears throat> I'm happy, but I want more. And I think that the boutique world of very, very high end, uh, amazing customers, we've got amazing customers and amazing clients because sometimes we make mistakes, for example, and it'll go into a customer and we explain to the, to the designer what's happened, they explain to the customer and we're forgiven each time, but we're very reactive and we, 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 do, we do fix our mistakes because they're obviously made by hand. Sometimes things go a little bit wrong. So we, we're very privileged like that. But um, Jonathan and I walked into our yarn supplier in Thailand. We have a handmade yarn. So it's not quite hand, but it, old machines and old, old traditional yarn um, making. Um, yes, yarn spinning. And <clears throat> he's actually... Um, He's got a, a, a mechanized factory, uh, so he has looms and he makes very cheap fabric, but he's being uh, literally priced out of the market by by even cheaper competition. For and sorry, sweat. sorry, Daniel, I hate to interrupt you, but I want to just cheap or inexpensive? Cheap. He's making cheap <laughs> fabric. It's literally he makes, I don't know, what did he say, 5,000 yards a day. And it's like a couple of cloth, dollars, yeah, undyed yeah. cotton that's used for I don't know what. Backing off, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's not for our so, industry at all. But okay. looms, are, looms are looms, you know, looms mm -hmm. are looms. And he's got 150 looms or something like that. And he's using 20 of them, 30 of them, 40 of them. I don't know. Anyway, most of the looms are not being used. And we can, we can repurpose those looms. And we've literally started a major project because he's not employing people. And it's, it's, it's 500, 500 miles south of where we are in Thailand. Thailand and Laos, by the way, are are culturally very, very similar. They're the similar languages, similar uh, habits, foods, both Buddhist countries, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of commonality um, historically as well. Anyway, the point being is that, you know, this is an opportunity for us. And that is why when we rebranded our company about a year and a half ago, we put the two most important things on our byline, which is Asian artisan heritage textiles. And I think the reason we chose Asia also because of my history, but but also because um, there are no craft councils and support grants and this, that, and the other, and whatever it is happening in Asia for their heritage textiles. Because in Asia, there's a, a different buying pattern than we have in Europe. And therefore, um, it's a mismatch. And these, uh, as is happening in America and in Europe, that these companies are closing, these old traditional companies are closing, it's worse there. So we, we go to this uh, guy who's been supplying our yarn. If we don't do an, a, an Hermes on him, in other words, Hermes goes to one of their uh, manufacturers who are having financial difficulties and just literally buys them up. We're not buying him up. But if we don't get him more business, you know, he won't be making our yarn for us in two or three mm -hmm. years time. Yeah, so it's that. worth our while to use somebody who's who's hungry for the business, who's enthusiastic, but will produce another type of product. And that's that's my philosophy. But then I just literally I'm not saying dump it, but almost dump it on Jonathan saying, hey, Jonathan, let's do this. Off you go. What do you think? And then he well, you carry on with what you do with the designs, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think I answered that. I mean, I, I as a weaver, um, the the I, I know how cloth is made. So, as Daniel said, a loom is a loom. You know, it's a hand jacquard loom. It's a dobby loom. It's a mechanized loom. You know, this one in Thailand is talking about is a hand loom, but it has a mechanical arm and uh, can be slowed down a lot so that we can use specialty yarn. So that's uh, a challenge and that's an opportunity. I, I want to say, getting back to convincing the client, the value add part, and convincing the client to use our product, I thought you were going to say, Josh, wouldn't it be great if you could, and I thought you would say, bring your client to Laos <laughs> and show them the factory and show them the weaving. And I mean, it sounds really cheesy, but like, give them a meal with the weavers there. If they'd be like, yes, I get it. You know, like, I, I really understand what's happening here. They can see it, they can feel it. And they, that's part of the, the, what we're trying to do and you know we're very small so I, I do the social media with Daniel and we're always trying to like okay let's show Laos let's show the mill let's show the weavers we have to really bang this message home because you know they're sitting in an office behind a desk at a computer our clients and they you know samples are coming in and they don't always know what what it means or what it 
what the story is behind it. So, you know, we have a lot of story to tell. Our challenge is how do we tell that? How do we how do we explain the value in it? Yeah, no, it's funny. I wasn't going to actually suggest bringing the clients to Laos because I don't mm. think you would get know, the value. You. you you wouldn't get the value for that. But I do think if you were able to bring the designers to Laos so yes. that they could tell the story, I think that there's some value in that too. But again, you know, haven't we gotten to a point now where because of social media, you almost don't have to go in person. Going in person, I mean, you know what you don't get? You don't get that smell when you walk when you walk into a room where there's all that all that material being mm. woven into something. And I, I can't even describe it, but every, you know, you guys know this, every thread, every fabric, every material has its own smell, its own scent, its own, you you can touch it. And I, I think that there's for me anyway, there's a magic in watching one thing become something else. Definitely. You know, you know what I mean? And I think that um, that's probably where the magic lies in what in what you do is watching a person, an actual living, breathing person who makes mistakes, who's thinking about, you know, what their kids might be doing at the moment when they're trying to do something else or, you know, machines don't think about that. It's 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 all, you know, ones and zeros, you know, everything's digitized now. So you can you can tell a machine what to make. I think. um it's really interesting, I think, with the uh, prevalence of AI, you know, to say, OK, make, you know, make one percent error in a material so that it can it can look handmade. You know, I, I think that I, I think it's going to get harder and harder to tell the difference between, per, you know, machine made and handmade. And I'm curious if that's something that you that you think about because there is a special nature. That's where the magic is, right? In the artisans that are crafting the product. Yeah, we've got a lot to what? Uh -huh. Sorry, not to be contradictory to you, but I, I think the opposite actually is happening. The more AI, the more artificial, the more plastic, the more regular the world is becoming, our product is looking more and more special. Right, it's kind of rising to the top. I mean, all, all artists and products and craft makers and makers of all kinds, it's it's standing out because, you know, even if you could put in a, a flaw in, in every one percent of an AI made fabric, the flaw would become regular. I mean, you just it, it's impossible, right? The human hand is impossible. Uh, I'm sure you'll you'll have people listening who will disagree with me, but you know, I think that you don't have that spirit in a machine made plastic, anything, right? It's just not, I mean, there, there are other attributes that it can have for sure, but it, it, it's not replaceable. The, the handmade is not replaceable. No. And I think that going back to COVID, I think that that's what a lot of people learned, right? That's a lot of people when they were home by themselves, what they wanted, they didn't, they didn't, nobody was like cuddling up with something plastic, right? <laughs> they wanted something that was personal to them that, you know, their home became so important. And we saw that reflected in our, in our business, right? Because they wanted things to be special. And I, you know, I think um, you were talking earlier about a, a, a younger generation, uh, Daniel, I think you were, and I wrote down coastal grandma and eccentric urban aunt, these kind of new trends that are coming up with Gen Z. I mean, not to sound so old, but um, all they're saying is we want whole <laughs> hand, handmade. We want special things. We don't want it to look the same, right? We don't want uh, a, a mass made. We want our eccentric aunt who went to the Mar flea market and bought something odd and put it, you know, the wrong proportion, but the wrong color, quote unquote. But it's personal, right? Or 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 their grandparents, you know, our, you know, our grandparents, 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 they didn't have machine made, right? Everything was made by somebody in a mill, you know, in a in a, a workroom in a wood shop you know it's a different world so we we want that you know we 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 crave that i think people are, are are going back to that and also on tiktok when you see people they're doing all kinds of stupid things but they're also doing a lot of cooking however bad it might be they're doing a lot of making in, mm -hmm. in fact all the videos that are quite popular are cooking and the making videos because ultimately it's an objective reality um, and the objective reality of eating, wearing, 
uh, all of these things as humans, you know, AI will uh, might help us uh, cure some diseases and be very useful in certain areas. But there's got to be, in my my opinion, a pushback at some point because we we crave genuine. This is our heart, and that's why I also mentioned before community. Ultimately, um, you know, none of our none of our it's often the very 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 wealthy people of the world or the ones who've got the most power don't seem to be very happy. <laughs> and the ones like our weavers, they're super happy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Everybody wants that happiness. And there's a reason for that. Very simple way of living life and making things and doing things brings you back to that level of primordial happiness. And if if anybody wants to know what, you know, what we're here on this planet for, it's joy and bliss. There's nothing else. <laughs> Well, I've said this before. I think, I, and I, I think it's credited to Picasso, who who said the the purpose of life is to find your gift, and the or the meaning of life is to find your gift, and the purpose of life is to give it away. And mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't think, I don't take that to be figuratively because I don't. Well, I think he did a lot of hand drawn napkins. Maybe gave them away. I don't think he gave his his work away. I <laughs> I think that the point he there paid is, for a couple of things in Montmartre, didn't he? <laughs> yes, yeah, <laughs> with yeah. paintings, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but again, you know, th that still establishes it as, as currency. And I think um, I'm getting way off base here, but, but the, the point is it's like, yeah, the, there is, there is value in, in something that's special. And I think, isn't that interesting too, is the gamble of handmade where, yeah, you're going to, you're going to get irregularities. You're going to get quote unquote mistakes that aren't really mistakes, they're character. And that's something why, you know, I, I find tremendous value in that. I think clients are seeking that. And I think it's a challenge for designers to source product like yours and find people like you to provide these things, which is why I, I love doing this. And which is also why I greatly appreciate the time. <clears throat> the time. And this was so much fun. I love talking to you guys. Thank you so much for making the time to do this today. Yeah, Very thank well. you so much. It's been fun. Design Hardware's newly remodeled showroom is where you will find a gallery style space with a thoughtful display of products, purposefully positioned to allow unbridled exploration and discovery. High end faucets, luxury tile, natural stone, wood floors, and bespoke hardware selections are presented in a holistic manner, strategically arranged to stimulate creativity and transition your vision from the conceptual stage to a fully realized space. Conveniently located, free parking available, stop by to find your inspiration. Collect samples, get expert advice, and tackle everything on your shopping list all in one place. Visit them online at designhardware.com or in the real world, 6053 West 3rd Street in Los Angeles. Thank you, Daniel and Jonathan, for taking the time to join me for this today. Amazing. Thank you to my partner sponsors, Thermosol, Design Hardware, Pacific Sales, Monogram, and TimberTech. Thank you for your considerable support of the design industry and those who comprise it. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to listen to the show. Thank you for downloading it, subscribing to it, and sharing it with your friends who you think might enjoy it as well. The thing, the, this thing of ours is amazing. 11 years strong, and I really couldn't do this without you. I wouldn't want to. Please keep those emails coming, convo by design at outlook.com with a show and guest suggestions. Reach out on Instagram as well at convo by design with an X. Tell me if there's a designer you'd like to learn more about, and we'll see if we can make that happen. Thank you for listening, downloading, subscribing, and sharing. It means a lot to me. Until the next episode, be well, and take today first. Mm -hmm.